If you wanna build a full-scale, multi-million dollar glamping business, then this will be an incredibly important video for you to watch. I have done glamping many times in many ways over the past few years. I've done everything from Wild Westing it to over the past few years, learning how to permit these glamp sites at scale in excruciating detail. If you've been following the channel or me in general, then you probably know I stopped doing the one-off stuff a long time ago so that I could focus on these bigger, better glamping village developments. And so what I wanna be better about on the Raw Built channel is teaching you the entire process Process and how to do this the right way. Because if you do, you can basically plan out your glamp site in phases and start small and scale up as big as you want from there. So for this episode, I wanted to bring in Laura Jimenez, who is a regulation expert in this world, who also happens to be one of my rock star host camp coaches, absolutely crushing it. So without further ado, let's talk about everything you need to know about permitting your glamping business. All right, Laura, welcome to the Rob Hill channel. How you doing? I'm doing great, Rob. How are you? Good, good. So you're one of my superstar students and you're crushing it out there and you're starting to get more into the glamping world. World. So I wanted to talk about some of the realities of getting into the glamping space in 2023 and 2024 and some of the permitting that's involved with uh, with getting into this because <laughs> back in the day, it was a bit of a wild west. You could really just kind of park anything anywhere. But if you're really talking about doing this at scale, there's a bit of a process involved, right? Just a bit. And thanks for bringing this up because I think a lot of people think that you can just throw up a tent and all is well. And the reality is that glamping it's a type of business that touches a lot of different types of rules that you have to follow. So one is just a, a planning and zoning rule. And that essentially says your, your jurisdiction and be that a city, be that a county, it really depends on where you're located. But they will say, these are the types of activities you can do in these specific locations, right? They'll all have, for the most part, a zoning ordinance, like West Virginia is the only state that I know of that doesn't have zones and the rest do. And they'll say, for example, in these specific areas, you can only have residential homes. In these specific areas, you can only have commercial businesses or you can only have industry, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the planning and zoning laws are going to apply and they're going to say where you can do a glamping site and if you can do a glamping site. So that's just yeah. one set of rules. Yeah. The other is going to be like the health department because you're going to have to like put in toilets and sinks and you have to get rid of waste. So so then the health department becomes involved. So there's lots of different areas that you have to be aware of when it comes sure. to glamping. Well, that's the thing is like, oh man, it's so tough because there's really a fine line between sort of the rapid prototype of going out to do it and then the actual full scale model. So I'll tell you, like we have a couple of people in host camp, for example, they are in actually in Kentucky in the Red River Gorge area and they don't have a building department. They are literally allowed to put glamping tents anywhere they want and there is no building to go and ask for permission. I've got another student who went, he's got a place in Georgia. Um, I can't remember the municipality specifically. And he called, he said, Hey, how do I get a permit for my little trailer that I have that I want to put in my backyard? And they kind of laughed and they're like, <laughs> yeah, we don't do permits for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then there's me where, you know, when you do this one, one or two times, like kind of in those types of municipalities, which is like really what I sort of started with, it's fine. But then when you talk about doing like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 of these, which is what I'm working on these days, it's really mm -hmm. impossible to do that. You actually do need to go through a pretty rigorous permitting process. In, in, in most of the time now I'm finding to get what's called like a conditional use permit or a special use permit. Mm -hmm. And this is basically the entire process that you have to go through to get the city or the municipalities buy-in to actually let you run this as a commercial business because that's, that's really what this is from a municipality standpoint is a commercial business. And thus you must sort of abide by commercial standards, right? That's right. Speaking of commercial, right? They are probably probably going to require you to have what's called a commercial driveway. So it's a, a driveway that's going to be wide enough for say emergency vehicles to be able to access the site. Even the roads leading up to your glamping site probably have to meet commercial standards. So that's why I say there's there's a lot of different sort of parts of law that a glamping business will touch that you just have to abide by. Yeah, this is super interesting. This actually just happened to me. It, well, it's been happening for the last two years in Williams, Arizona, which is where we've basically decommissioned our tents so that we could focus on the full. We can't do the, we can't even do the tents anymore. They 
really they cracked down on that big time. Certain YouTubers mm -hmm. opened their mouth about that area, and uh, that was me. And then we, we decided to okay, well let's buy land and let's just build 60 of these. And so mm -hmm. we have been working on that conditional use permit for about two years now. And in order for us to do that, we have to widen the highway, the shoulder, to actually yep. get to that street. And then we have to have some mm -hmm. kind of gravel or paved road to get to that. Mm -hmm. And it's like a $300,000 improvement that we have to make for the city in order for them to let mm -hmm. us run this commercial business. Yep. And keep in mind, if you have any common use areas, you may have to be ADA compliant, the Americans with Disabilities Act, right? So people who may not have full mobility, they might be in wheelchairs, they should have access to any common sites. And so that's going to be an added expense as well as added structural improvements in all likelihood. Yeah, most of the time, I think in those instances, you just have to delegate a percentage of your entire campsite to be right. ADA compliant, right? Okay, cool. Yep, that's right. Yeah. But usually common spaces, right? Like if there's a bathhouse, for example, it, it, uh, at least a portion of it and leading up to it will have to be ADA compliant. Yeah, which makes sense. I'm totally for that, obviously. I mean, that, that just, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. So mm -hmm. let's talk about a little bit about the permitting process. I mean, we've kind of alluded to what it is, but I, I want to sort of talk through my process like that I've faced in the Smoky Mountains and kind of see if that mm -hmm. lines up with some of the stuff. Because right now you're actively trying to go out and start from the ground up, right? Okay, yep. cool. We started one small site. Now we're starting, we're trying to start a much bigger site. So yeah. we've, we've kind of gone through the process once and like we are actively talking with the, the various counties in advance before we even buy the property. Yeah, I've, I've been through the process three times now and uh, it is always different and an interesting journey. Let's talk about yeah. the Smoky Mountains and I think this process is pretty much going to not be universal, but it, it's pretty similar. So we mm -hmm. had to hire what's called like a civil engineer. A civil engineer is basically the person that they kind of design your site plan, but it's not just a site plan. It's a it's a very like technical site plan that shows topography and drainage and slopes and natural erosion barriers to make sure that the water is not flowing into anywhere that could damage mother nature and all that kind of stuff. And so what we did even before that is we went to the city. I think this is the best thing you can do. There's calling a city and then there's actually going in person and it makes a world of difference to go in person because a lot of people in this industry call and they all have their sites on, oh, I want to build a tiny house village. And then they're like, oh boy, another one of these and they kind of don't give you much attention. So when you actually go in person and you talk to them and you say, hey, this is what I'm looking to do. You show them photos. Then they can actually like pull up the zoning and the ordinances and all that kind of stuff and tell you what is and isn't allowed. And then you work with the civil engineer who is a lot more acquainted with the code to actually kind of work through that zoning and see how they can design it to fit the parameters of the county. Does this differ too much from like the glamp site that you established or some of the ones that you've looked into? It's pretty similar. The only thing I would add is to say that that conversation goes a lot better if you have an actual address of a property that yeah. way they can they can say you know based on because they have access to all of these maps on the county website so they'll have like a topo map the topography they'll have a flood plains map they'll have a soil map and they'll be able to tell you based on the specific property whether they see any sort of red or yellow flags based on on what you want to do so i would say to have that conversation with the county or the city whomever your governing jurisdiction is once you have a property in mind that you have not bought yet because it may not be be the right property for you to buy based on what yeah. the county says. Yeah, it's best to do the due diligence before. And uh, yeah, I've had to really play the game on that and be like, yeah, I'm in a scroll on this because if you just, yeah, usually every time I'm like, I'm thinking about buying it, they're like, all right, we'll call us when you buy it. Uh, right. So yeah, that's why I think calling is not really the best use of, I mean, it's a good like way to brush up on it initially, but you really do have to make it a priority to go meet the people in person. It makes a world mm -hmm. of difference. And so that's exactly right. Like we're basically trying to figure out the address, the property that you want to buy. And we want to talk to the people at the county and talk about what the red flags are and all that good stuff. Because what happened in Sevierville was, right, which is right outside of Gatlinburg, my property was what's in called the critical slope zone, meaning that in order for a fire truck to get up there, we basically had to build a 22 foot wide road to access the top of the mountain, which would be a multi-million dollar road. And it's like a whole thing. So we had to shift our plans initially from what we thought we wanted to do, uh, which is fine. We scaled it down and we're actually, we have all our permits. We can actually break ground on that project, I think, which is pretty cool <laughs> two years later. Awesome. But the idea is you kind of want to find that stuff out before you buy the property. When I bought that property, I was like, I'm going to build 50. And now it's like, I'm going to build five. Still a win, but <laughs> yep. not not the original win, right? And um, mm -hmm. once you kind of get that site plan drawn up, 
you go to the city. Um, I went back to my zoning and planning department and then my building department to kind of show them where we landed. They sort of mm -hmm. gave our overall like, yeah, okay, this sounds good. This looks good. And then we have to go to what's called like the town hall meeting, which mm -hmm. is, have you ever seen like Parks and Rec? It's pretty much just like that. I found a sandwich in one of your parks and I want to know why it didn't have mayonnaise. All the people from the town come in and they like, we don't want it for this reason, or we, we don't want you to have crazy sex parties on the property. And it's like, hold on, what? It has nothing to do with Airbnb. What are you talking about? So you have to kind of squash a lot of objections within your community to just make it clear that you're trying to build something cool. You're not trying to build like a crazy, like Airbnb party town kind of thing. I don't think there are topless parks. Well, let's build the first one and be heroes. Now, when I did it in Sevierville, the big kind of key difference from other municipalities that I've done this in is that we actually only had to go through one town hall meeting and then the entire council voted. And that was actually, nobody opposed it in the city. That was actually the, a surprisingly easy one, to be honest. Everyone voted in accordance. They all said, yes, we agree. This sounds good. And then we actually got our permit. But in most municipalities, and I'm curious about your experience, like how far down you have to go down this chain, you initially had go through several rounds of these town hall meetings where people mm -hmm. can sort of object to this if they want to if they're like hey we don't want to do this and then <laughs> you have to go back and revise your site plan and then you have to go back and represent and then people will oftentimes object or the council will like object they give you notes and then you go back and you kind of play this game several times mm -hmm. and then assuming that everybody is happy then you can get your conditional use permit and then you can break ground when you did this kind of on a smaller scale did you have to go through that entire process or was it just like going through the building department no we didn't have to go through that larger process because we weren't doing what they would consider a campsite. We were doing a much smaller project. So it wouldn't require going before the, the, the town planning commission or the board of zoning, whatever it's called in, in that particular jurisdiction. So thankfully we, we avoided that step and we're able to just go through to just the, the building permit process. But the county that we're currently in, there's going to be three steps. So one would be the pre-application phase where they will look at our draft materials and tell us what we're missing, what we need to add, what we need to be careful of before we even submit the application, which is, I think, a really good thing to do. Yeah. Then it would go before the Planning and Zoning Commission. And then once they approve, it goes before the Board of Zoning Appeals, which is where the public can comment and they can object and, you know, they can either decline or approve your application. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a big one. So I've actually had two experiences at a three where this has been the case. The first time was in Virginia and it was a bit odd. Every like literally everybody banded against us. Like one neighbor got super mad and disgruntled. The guy that sold us the lot, his realtor, I don't know. It, it's a long convoluted story, but effectively his realtor sort of lied to him about why we were buying the property. Our realtor conveyed, we wanted to build like a little Airbnb community. His realtor knew from my understanding, what I'm hearing now that he wouldn't like that and like never relayed that. And so whenever he found out that this is what we're doing, he got super super angry and said, we deceived him. We never did. And then he went around the entire city and literally got over 200 people to show up to County Hall to be like, this guy is a liar from California. And all he does is rip apart communities. And me and my partner are like, whoa, hold on. All we're trying to do is build like seven A-frames, like tiny A-frames. What, what, what's the problem here? And then they, this is a little less relevant, but he found out I was a YouTuber and a content creator. And then he went and took like really random quotes that I said that weren't even bad, but he was just like, look what he said. Okay, my my quote was like, yeah, I'm all about, you know, depending on the local community to boost the tourism and people will pay lots of money to glamp. And I think it's a great opportunity to get into this business. And he's like, see, he just wants to make money. And everyone's like, no, we hate capitalism. I mean, it's like that whole thing. So Ugh. that one kind of got away and we had to pretty much close that project down. Lesson for me is I will never be on my applications as, as myself again. But mm. funny enough, we ended up selling that property back to him for a profit. So we actually ended up winning on that one. But that's just the power of like the community if they're not for this yep they have a lot of power in stopping you to do it and that's kind of what's yep. happening right now we're trying to work through it in the grand canyon we had a town hall some people were like hey yeah we're kind of against this but you know like honestly it's kind of cool if you develop it and you bring electricity to the road and it's like yeah like we also think that's cool and like one lady didn't even live there and she was like well i don't live there i live in new york my parents gave me one acre on that road and i don't i don't know if y'all should do it and then we're like you've never have you ever been there and she's like no and we're like okay 
okay. And then the other person, our direct neighbor, was the one who had the greatest opposition, which we kind of felt for him. And we're like, hey, we understand, but this is like a really luxury glamp site. It really should honestly like improve the area quite a bit, but mm -hmm. some people don't mm -hmm. want that. And so now we're kind of having to like work through this conditional use pr permit where we get it for five years, but if we don't perform super well or like we are ruckus, we, we cause a ruckus or we're loud, they basically have the power to kind of petition to get this conditional use permit closed down, which is a very mm -hmm. specific scenario in that county. So just understand if you're getting into this permitting world, like oftentimes if you're going full scale and we're talking about doing like 20, 30, 40, 50 units, mm -hmm. you definitely, I think, want to enlist the help of a civil engineer or a civil engineer firm to kind of help you get through that because it adds a little bit of credibility and it was able to help us sort of get all the answers before we got asked the questions. And that that's kind of like a, a big thing is like having your T's crossed and your I's dotted before you go into the meeting is kind of a big deal. It might actually be required. I know in, in my county and, and surrounding counties that a stamped engineer plan has to be submitted with the application. But you're also bringing up a great point that like doing the right paperwork is one thing, but doing the outreach to neighbors who are going to have a say in your business, I think is, is an incredibly important step to take. And one thing that you can do, you know, all of these meetings, they're recorded. There are either meeting minutes or there's an actual video recording of the meeting. You can go and, and watch them and see what people say, how, how they opposed a similar project. And I would highly recommend doing that so that you get the feel for you know, what are the individual council members going to say? What are what are some of the concerns of the neighbor? Know that ahead of time. And then just talk to your neighbors, you know, knock on their doors and say, hey, you know, this is the kind of project I'd like to do. Show them that you are a legitimate, you know, business person, that you're not here to, you know, stand up some fly by night organization that's unsafe and unhealthy and is gonna have loud parties, but do that outreach. I think it's incredibly important. It's as important, if not more important than doing the paperwork the right way. Yeah, for sure. I I think the to kind of piggyback on that most of the time what you're going to need to do funny enough i did not really need to do this in gatlinburg but most of the time you have to put together what's called like a, a narrative like a camp narrative mm -hmm. because effectively what you're trying to do if you're trying to do this at scale and get that conditional use permit is get a campground <laughs> that's effectively the the ultimate idea now obviously they're glamping units but it's still the same uh, restrictions and the same ordinances as a campground, effectively yeah mm -hmm. and so a narrative basically is the story it's not like a it's not meant to be a fluffy like you know we want to bring the flowers out and it's supposed to be like a pretty technical narrative of like what the business plan is and it's uh -huh. relatively thorough and a lot of times at addresses a lot of the you know ordinances and like the laws and how you're going to like work around it and here's our plan for fire for fire pits we're going to do this and this and this and this and this is kind of where you uh -huh. address a lot of the objections that you just talked about that your neighbors have and then you submit that and people get to read that the county gets to respond to that and give you feedback on that and a lot of people don't know that you can actually just go oftentimes and look up the narratives of other properties and other uh -huh. similar types of projects that have been approved. And you can use yep. that to build yours. That's right. And I would definitely look at any very similar projects, right? So if you're looking to permit a, a campsite, find the applications of previous campsites. Now you may have to go back a few years because these things don't pop up every day because they're they're tough to, to build and they're expensive to build, but definitely find the narratives of very similar projects and use a lot of that language. Yeah, for sure. Well, man, this is there's so much to talk about on this. Maybe we'll do a part two if everyone's like, man, yes, I need more of this. But if you could give one tip to people that are looking to go out and start a glamping business, what would that tip be? Be prepared for it to take three to five years. Three to it's, five. It's not okay. gonna be it's not gonna be a, a, a one year venture from the time of, of you have the idea to the time you're opening your doors. And, and here's how I would think about those five years, including getting your 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 land. That's gonna take a year. So you're looking for properties, you're doing the feasibility studies, you're talking to the county, is this property gonna be right? That's probably gonna take about a year. And then, you know, in that phase, you're also starting your application, but probably year two is gonna be your application for your conditional use permit. In my particular county, the, the application phase takes 180 days. Wow. Okay. That's the year. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess that's true. I mean, I've been working on mine in Arizona now for about two years. We're coming.
coming up on year mm -hmm. three, I think. And then mm -hmm. my Gatlin work, Gatlinburg one has technically been in the works for two years, although we could have started that a while ago. Um, mm -hmm. I would say for anybody that's looking to do this, if you're looking to do this full scale, like what we're talking about, I'd very mm -hmm. much recommend buying an existing campground that's dilapidated mm -hmm. and fixing that up because you're oftentimes grandfathered into that permit and what they got approved for way easier than ground up development. But maybe you and I can do a part two on ground up development and actually break down this process a little bit more uh, step by step for people. But you have to comment if you're watching this that you want to see that or else we won't do it and hit the like and subscribe button. Or for anybody that wants to find you and kind of look at your channel and follow up with you and connect, where can they do that? Yeah, absolutely. So I am at Airbnb Girl Laura on YouTube and Instagram. And if anyone wants to reach out, they have questions about like zoning regulations, permitting requirements. Um, I also consult on that. So feel free to reach out. Awesome. And of course, if you're a host camper, you can always find Laura in her monthly coaching calls where she talks about legalities and regulations and everything in between. Thank you so much for yep. your time. We appreciate you. Do me a favor, go cover your lens and we'll say we'll catch you on the next episode of Rob Built. Catch you on the next episode of Rob Built. All right, there we go. Bye, everybody.